Hello, I'm Nathan Martin with Advine Pollination Hive and the UnityProcess.com. And today I'm going to be speaking of the dangers of emotionally motivated reasoning. This has to do with really where we fabricate a story to justify our position because we don't want to see something. We don't want to deal with the potential consequences. Or we actually go into processing our emotions and working through them so that we can become more reasonable and make a wise decision. If this is something that interests you, stay tuned. A recent imaging study by psychologist Drew Weston and his colleagues at Emory University provides firm support for the existence of emotional reasoning. Just prior to the 2004 Bush-Kerry presidential elections, two groups of subjects were recruited, 15 ardent Democrats and 15 ardent Republicans. Each was presented with conflicting and seemingly damaging statements about their candidate, as well as about more neutral targets such as actor Tom Hanks, who, it appears, is a likable guy for people of all political persuasions. Unsurprisingly, when the participants were asked to draw a logical conclusion about a candidate from the other wrong political party, the participants found a way to arrive at a conclusion that made the candidate look bad, even though logic should have mitigated the particular circumstances and allowed them to reach a different conclusion. Here's where it gets interesting. When this emote control began to occur, parts of the brain normally involved in reasoning were not activated. Instead, a constellation of activations occurred in the same areas of the brain where punishment, pain, and negative emotions are experienced, that is, in the left insula, lateral frontal cortex, and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Once a way was found to ignore information that could not be rationally discounted, the neural punishment areas turned off and the participant received a blast of activation in the circuits involving rewards akin to the high an addict receives when getting his fix. In essence, the participants were not about to let facts get in the way of their hot-button decision-making and quick buzz of reward. None of the circuits involved in conscious reasoning were particularly engaged, says Weston. Essentially, it appears as if partisans twirl the cognitive kaleidoscope until they get the conclusions they want, and then they get massively reinforced for it, with the elimination of negative emotional states and activation of positive ones. Ultimately, Weston and his colleagues believe that emotionally biased reasoning leads to the stamping in or reinforcement of a defensive belief, associating the participant's revisionist account of the data with positive emotion or relief in elimination of distress. The result is the partisan beliefs are calcified and the person can learn very little from new data, Weston says. Weston's remarkable study showed that neural information processing related to what he terms motivated reasoning appears to be qualitatively different from reasoning when a person has no strong emotional stake in the conclusions to be reached. The study is thus the first to describe the neural process that underlie political judgment and decision making, as well as to describe processes involving emote control, psychological defense, confirmatory bias, and some forms of cognitive dissonance. This is from Evil Genes, Why Rome Fell, Hitler Rose, Enron Failed, and My Sister Stole My Mother's Boyfriend by Barbara Oakley, Ph.D. This has far-reaching implications. For instance, when we present any information or perspective that conflicts with another status quo, whether about religion, politics, science, or society in general, and actually may I say reality in general, many will experience emotional pain. Rather than motivate them to examine where their pain is coming from within their own thinking, or why it is there, most people will be motivated to fabricate a story that resolves the conflicting information, and they will receive an emotional reward in the form of endorphins that reinforces their cognitive biases. This is what is known in spirituality as an emotional attachment. As the emotional discomfort and the possibility for a reward for bypassing around the pain is what ultimately blocks rational thought and discourse. Without the possibility of a reward for running from their pain, 
people would be forced to deal with their emotional wounds. This phenomenon demonstrates why it is of the utmost importance to learn how to ask questions of ourselves and those we interact with. For when the right question is asked that provokes our or their thinking and hits our or their core emotional needs, it bypasses this defense mechanism. In order to get past our emotional reasoning, we need to be broken open with the right questions, especially those that trigger an epiphany. And I'd venture to guess that an epiphany in our reasoning is also accompanied with its own endorphin rewards. This will cause a different sort of feedback loop, one that encourages growth and truth rather than entropy and self-deception. Let's look at this pattern in an extreme example, where stalkers get their high from the stories and fantasies they create. They feel pain from a perceived rejection and punishment, which is likely triggered by seeing a beautiful woman or man that could remind them of a childhood trauma of some sort, or who they perceive could save them from their loneliness. They then fabricate a story in their imagination, fueled by their emotional reasoning and need for an escape from the punishment and rejection. And their imaginary relationship rewards them from the pleasure centers in their brain. They are addicts to the reward that they get from avoiding their pain and rejection. So they keep making up stories to justify their fantasies so that they can keep getting high from them. In this way, their mental fantasies can become quite elaborate and detailed as a means of avoiding the diminishing returns provided by the punishment pleasure feedback loop. Because we all know that addiction actually has diminishing returns. The pleasure you get from the story eventually goes away because it's not really resolving the conflict. And so then you have to create an even bigger story and then an even bigger story. Well, these stalkers are so damaged that they're creating these massive stories about reality that just isn't true, but they're getting as high as a kite off of them. In a less extreme example, let's take the falling in love with falling in love addiction that can be part of the online dating scene. The hard work of a mature monogamous relationship might be too painful to cope with and too traumatizing to relive past failures. Thus, the addiction to fall in love again and again when everything still feels safe. Whenever the pain of conflict comes to the forefront of a relationship that has lost its initial luster, emotionally motivated reasoning will provide all of the reasons to end the relationship and start anew, again, and again, and again, and again. In an abusive relationship, the fantasy of what could be, or the fear of grieving what was hoped for when they first met, can outweigh any evidence to the contrary, including emotional and physical abuse. Many stay with an abusive partner because of the pleasure they receive from creating excuses to stay with somebody who is not a good match for them, or who in reality matches their need for the punishment reward cycle. Victims and villains find themselves in their dysfunctional patterns. They attract each other equally. Intellectual intelligence without emotional intelligence is like physics without math. They not only need each other, but emotional intelligence supports and balances the intellect. There's so many intellectually intelligent people that have zero emotional intelligence. They're doctors, they're scientists, they're leading mathematicians. They're doing these things, they're part of this giant machine, but they lack this emotional intelligence that helps them to differentiate psychologically from the mass herd. And so they're very imbalanced and they're, they're spouting things like rationality and things like that but they're missing a very large part of their intelligence. It's like literally, it's literally like physics without math. These smart people without emotional intelligence. So let's look at some other manifestations. Politics, that was in the initial description in the book, Evil Genes. Politics, where people don't want to admit that their political side is wrong, even when, when confronted with evidence to the contrary. The other side is bad, their side is good, and they will come up with all kinds of rationale to support their side and to demonize the other side. And then they get a high from this. So this past election with Trump and Hillary, this is a big high, even for the losers. Now the losers are going into their own little addictive cycle and the winners are going to a separate addictive cycle. The losers don't want to admit that they were they lost. They don't want to admit that they were wrong. The winners, once things turn out that that not a lot gets done, they won't want to admit that things are actually bad when their, their candidate doesn't actually follow through on his promises. Hyper-rationality, that was what the last picture was about. People who are hyper-rational, 
they're getting a really big dose of dopamine of this uh, reward system because they're able to bypass around their emotions and be accepted by society, be accepted by you know, what, what society says is okay, what their university says okay, what science says is okay. They're very hyper-rational and they're getting a, a dopamine hit from it. They're, they're actually not rational because they're missing their emotional intelligence aspect, but they, they have this appearance of rationality. Polyamory. Things aren't going well in their monogamous relationship. They're not able to stay true and so they start creating these reasons why they have to have another partner or why they have to cheat. Polyamory is like the open cheating. But if you're not openly cheating and you have a, a mistress or something like that with an affair, that also, even though there's lies involved and that's a little more damaging than open polyamory, there's still this cognitive bias where you're, you're creating this story to fuel your need to escape the parent conflict, the conflict that's coming about by your monogamous relationship, the conflict that's coming about because you're not able to be happy in your relationship. But why is that? Well, there's contradictions in your relationship that need to be resolved. And most people are not adept at resolving those conflicts. And so then they find a reason to work around it. And that's polyamory. Another instance, you have immature monogamy, where two people stay together in a bad relationship because that's what they're supposed to do. They're now getting their feedback and they're creating justifications. They're getting their rewards for staying in a bad relationship when they should actually leave because neither one of them is actually working through their conflicts. They're just existing together. And this is just as immature and just as bad as polyamory, at least in polyamory. I would say that's actually a little better because they're admitting that something's wrong with their immature monogamy. But that doesn't mean that they're actually working through their problems. They're just finding new excuses to justify why they need to leave. Job, spouse, partner, friends, etc. Jumping. You jump from job to job, you create these false reasons. You jump from spouse to spouse, partner to partner, friend to friend, house to house. Because you can't stay put. You keep getting this these rewards from jumping around. Abuse, Stockholm Syndrome, you stay in this abusive relationship or in abusive situations. Heck, I mean, most people in the world have Stockholm Syndrome with their, their governments. They don't want to work through the apparent conflict between how they feel and what their governments are doing. And so they start creating these emotionally motivated reasons why their, their government is good or why they need their candidate in the office. But really, it's just more abuse cycle, and it's Stockholm Syndrome. Substance abuse. Yes, there is an addiction and a reward in substance abuse. That's probably the most overt of all of these and the most known, is when you're addicted to a substance, you're getting a reward. Why? You're drowning away your sorrows. You're avoiding your sorrows. You're avoiding the apparent conflicts. But substance abuse is just a, an overt way to do it, but all these other reasons are also ways to do it. Religious affiliation and beliefs. Yes, you can escape your contradictions and your, your bad thought patterns and your conflicts in your world by running to religion and your, your beliefs. You can start blaming God and, you know, God's going to get you and you're going to start making excuses for God's behavior and you're going to start making excuses for your own behavior. Hey, I'm getting a reward from God for blowing myself up, or I'm getting a reward from God for, for yelling at you and telling you you're going to go to hell. These are also a reward that be, these people are getting. It's because they're addicted to religion. They're actually addicted to the pleasure, and they're just running away. They're using religion to run away. Another religion most people don't know about is scientism. So the scientism is this hyper-rational science that lacks spirituality, that lacks spirit. It lacks the subjective, it is purely objective and not subjective. What we really need is a balance between the objective and subjective. And there are some forms of, of science that actually do have that. You know, homeopathy for one. Then you have things like quantum physics for another. Another thing is nationalism, statism, communism, socialism, or any other ism. Besides, of course, like anarchy. But these are things that also can become an addiction, trying to find other people and ways and joining a group of this group or that group to feel safe and get a reward, this dopamine reward in the brain that comes from avoiding your inner pain and conflict. 
And the last thing is spiritual bypassing. And sometimes this is called uh, spiritual ego. The spiritual ego is where you have now transcended all space and time, and I no longer have to deal with these things because I have already arrived. Yet there's contradiction after contradiction, but people bypass around because they don't want to actually have to deal with it. And so now they're enlightened, and they go to enlightened teachers who tickle their ears and tell them everything they want to hear, and also tell them it's okay to spiritually bypass. Yes, you've arrived. We're all one. We're transcending this together. And they also give all these spiritual platitudes and things that really are pretty shallow and they don't really make sense. But as long as they give this dopamine reward in the brain and avoid our inner conflict, then it's okay. But these are all just manifestations of this problem. Manipulation. This type of behavior, this escapism mentality that many of us have, is not just dangerous for the individual because of self-delusion and addictive behavior but because it is one of the primary tools used by parasitic people and groups to manipulate people to their own nefarious goals. All they need to do is create a false flag event or put up a sad story on the nightly news to steer public opinion and behavior towards an agenda that benefits their own selfish interests. For example, 9-11. That was a, something that steered public opinion and actually the world towards a specific goal, the war on terrorism and more conflict. Another one is when they showed in all the, the papers and news media all across the world the Syrian refugees and little child washed up onto shore after having drowned. That was a sad story that they used to steer an agenda. It really had nothing to do with that child. They didn't care about the child. They could have very well just drowned the child themselves, all so that they could manipulate people towards their own goals. So when we're trying to work with other people, we're trying to connect to them and let them know that they're really messed up. You know, can't you see the truth? Can't you see what's really going on out there? So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about next. So when we ask another a thought-provoking question, we must do so with the intent of connecting with our internal locus of control. Otherwise, we will connect with their externalized perception of themselves and reality and they will push back with defensiveness and emotionally motivated rationale. Our own underlying motivation for asking them questions holds a key to which aspect of them that we will connect with. For if we are attempting to convert them for our own externalized needs, such as to quell our guilt or to make ourselves feel safer and or more free, then we will only speak to their external aspect. However, if we are motivated by our genuine love and passion for expressing our creativity in the world, and from our desire to be an inspiration for those we come into contact with, free from any desire to meet our baser needs, then our questions will speak to their internal aspect. When we engage our internal self with our internal self, we will then have the opportunity for a fair-minded dialogue, and from there, the opportunity to spark a much-needed epiphany within them, which will cause them to undergo an internal transformation and change from the inside out. So we have to be careful on this that a lot of people use spiritual bypassing. Oh, yes, I'm really just, I have a love for humanity, but then they get all defensive. Well, if they're getting defensive, that's a mirror letting you know that it's not just a love for humanity. You have a hidden need that you're trying to cover up, that you're trying to get around, that you're trying to avoid. You're trying to feel safe or free, and they're going to show you that by becoming defensive. I mentioned that receiving an epiphany may also have the capacity to reward the brain. And while I do not have scientific evidence to prove this theory, I can state with 100% certainty that Aline and I experience epiphanies accompanied with euphoric feelings. When we go into a dialectical discussion, where we are stuck in a selfish either-or argument, we will work through our feelings and reflect on the core reasons, causes, in our mind patterns responsible for the ability to work together. As a result, we will experience an epiphany that changes how we view the situation, and expands our awareness and understanding of ourselves. We get a high from it. It actually gives us euphoric feelings when we work through an argument or a conflict. We use our reason to actually work through our biases and emotional attachments so that we can then better understand ourselves and each other. Our emotions are like the indicator lights and instrumentation on a car's dashboard. They provide us with subtle feedback about the quality of our thinking. Just like this speedometer tells us our speed, 
so that we can either press or depress on the gas pedal to adjust our speed. Learning to work through and process our feelings gives us the opportunity to modify and adjust our mental thought patterns to those that better serve our overall quality of life. We can remove ourselves from the negative feedback loop of pain and punishment, where we fabricate an illusion to get a reward that provides diminishing returns, aka the addiction cycle. Rather than fabricate false narratives that give us a temporary reward from the pleasure centers in our brain, we can process our emotional upsets with shadow work and critical thinking. Every time we are presented with information that conflicts with what we think we know about ourselves in the world, we don't have to devolve into a fantasy. We can instead process what we are feeling and receive an epiphany and reward that serves the truth. This mental pattern will allow us to deepen into who we are instead of escape from who we are. So here's the, the cycle. You have the lie on the left side and you have the truth on the right. So from the start, we can feel pain from an apparent contradiction and we can either fabricate a story with reason or process emotions and conflicts with reason. And then from there, we will either experience a reward for avoiding ourselves or we experience a reward for finding ourselves. So this is really interesting. Most people don't have, they've never experienced what processing emotions and conflict with reason is like. And so they've never actually experienced what the, the rewards from finding oneself. You've never experienced rewards from the epiphany. But we're always conditioned more and more with television, media, schooling, our parents, society in general, religion, to fabricate stories and then using reason to fabricate those stories, our imagination. Then we experience a reward, a reward for avoiding oneself. So we're, we're really stuck in that rut and in that pattern. And we're in that negative feedback loop of uh, this fabrication and going deeper and deeper into lies. And because we're going deeper and deeper into lies, we're, we're getting further and further away from ourselves. The thought patterns in our brain, in fact, even our neurological uh, makeup reflects this. We don't have the capacity to even get an epiphany anymore. We don't understand what that feels like. And so that's why Aline and I do sessions with people and we help people to discover these epiphanies for themselves. We ask them questions. We start diving into their childhood and asking them these questions so that they can see what it feels like through a dialogical experience, through Socratic questioning, so that they can start finding their epiphanies. And once they start knowing what that feels like, knowing what it's like to get an epiphany, a very deep transformational epiphany, then they, they will actually be able to recreate that experience for themselves. And now when they come into a apparent conflict or contradiction, they have a choice. They can either fabricate or they can process. And that that's really amazing because they, they didn't have that choice before. They only could fabricate a story with reason and stay in the lie. They didn't know how to move in any other way. But our sessions actually give them that experience so that now that they know what it's like, they can replicate it in their own life. They don't need us anymore. They just know how to do it. And they go off and they, they spread that to others. They help others find their own epiphanies through asking them questions because they themselves are adept at asking themselves questions. If you're interested in learning more about processing your emotions, you can check out our website, theunityprocess.com, as well as our Duality to Unity Feelings Wheel, linked here, which gives a practical tool and instructions to use with processing your emotional upsets. I also have a YouTube channel filled with videos demonstrating how to use emotional freedom techniques, also known as meridian tapping, in working through your issues. And that channel is Be Free with EFT. Again, that's Be Free with EFT. A link to all three will be provided in the information section below this video. If you enjoyed this video, please click like. If you're not already a subscriber and would like to keep up to date on my videos, please subscribe. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. I'm Nathan Martin with the Divine Pollination Hive and the UnityProcess.com. Be safe, be sovereign, be well.